This is Jennifer Gonzalez welcoming you to episode 70 of the Cult of Pedagogy podcast. In this episode, we're going to learn about hyperdocs and how they can transform the way you teach. If you've never seen a hyperdoc, let me try and describe it to you. In its most common form, it's a lesson or unit written on a Google Doc, which is basically Google's online version of Microsoft Word, in case you don't know. The doc usually has some kind of a chart on it. In that chart are all of the instructions for the parts of the lesson. It includes some kind of introduction or uh, anticipatory set, some kind of direct instruction where students learn something new, some kind of application, and possibly an assessment, an extension, or a creative activity. For every part of the lesson, there is also at least one link that takes the student to a video, an article, a collaborative document, or some other interactive online tool. The whole lesson is contained in one package, typically designed for students to work through on their own and at their own pace. So what is so great about this? A lot. For starters, a hyperdoc is automated. Students work through it without needing you to guide them through each step that gives you a lot more time to interact directly with students. Second, it's flexible. If one part of your lesson isn't working, you can just change it in the HyperDoc and the change takes effect immediately. There's no need to recopy all of your materials. Also, HyperDocs are dynamic. Because they're digital, they allow you to include all kinds of multimedia content, videos, slideshows, websites, podcasts, the list goes on and on. Finally, HyperDocs are customizable. If each student gets a copy of a HyperDoc, the elements can be changed on each one to meet individual students' needs. This idea of putting a lesson together into one package that students can work through on their own has been evolving in different forms in classrooms all over the place. My first introduction to this concept started when I met math teacher Natalie McCutcheon, who showed me in episode 30 how she sets up a system of self-paced learning for her students. In her system, students get chapter guides that they work through on their own. These guides include videos, skills practices, and assessments, and students access these all on their own. They decide how many skills practices they need, and they take the assessments when they're ready. I loved this system, And judging by the response I got from my readers and listeners, a lot of you did too. Later, in episode 50, I talked to Tracy Enos, a middle school language arts teacher, who showed me how she uses what she called playlists to organize a whole unit of study into a single Google Doc. She would map out step-by-step what students should do, providing hyperlinks right in the doc to the resources they would need. By setting everything up ahead of time, this allowed students to work independently and freed the teacher up to engage one-on-one with students. Little did I know that right around that same time, another group of teachers in the San Francisco Bay Area was giving this same concept a different name. Lisa Highfill, Kelly Hilton, and Sarah Landis called these digital lesson plans hyperdocs, and they believed so much in them that they wrote a book, the Hyperdoc Handbook, where they explore all the possibilities offered by this format, show readers how to create them, and explain how a well-designed hyperdoc can make learning more interactive, collaborative, and personalized. What I really like about these educators' approach is that they really push teachers to design lessons that aren't just conveniently packaged, but offer opportunities for students to collaborate, think critically, and create. In this episode, I talked with Highfill, Hilton, and Landis about all of these things and about the online hub they have created where teachers share and remix their own hyperdocs, something you will definitely want to take a look at as you start your own hyperdoc journey. To find links to their book, their website, and everything else we talk about, go to cultofpedagogy.com, click podcast, and go to episode 70. Before we get started, I would like to thank Kidum for sponsoring this episode. Kidum is a collaborative learning platform that enables teachers to plan, assess, and analyze learning all in one place. With Kidum's new student dashboard, teachers can empower students to take ownership of their learning. 
Students have the ability to track their own progress on skills, access and submit work, and communicate with teachers on assignments. Kidum is 100% free for teachers and students. To learn more, visit cultofpedagogy.com slash Kidum, K-I-D-D-O-M. I also want to thank you for the reviews you've left for this podcast on iTunes. Reviews really help to raise the visibility of a podcast, which brings more listeners in and gets these ideas into more classrooms. If you think more teachers need to be listening to this podcast, head over to iTunes, search for the Cult of Pedagogy podcast, click on ratings and reviews, and then leave a review and tell me what you think. Thank you so much. Now, here is my interview with Lisa Highfill, Kelly Hilton, and Sarah Landis, the authors of the HyperDoc Handbook. I would like to welcome Lisa Highfill, Kelly Hilton, and Sarah Landis to the show. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and just so that people, when they're listening, can get some sense of what your voices are, why don't we just take turns? Kelly, say hello so we can hear your voice. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly. And Sarah? Hi, guys. Glad to join you. Lisa? Hi, I'm Lisa. Nice to meet y'all. <laughs> okay, good. That at least when people, people will have some idea of who's talking and when. So um, if we could just start by tell, uh, having you tell us a little bit about just sort of what you do right now, work-wise, um, and you know what your current role is in education, and then we'll we'll get into talking more about the hyperdocs. All right, I can share a little. Um, we work full time in Pleasanton Unified School District, which is about forty-five minutes east of San Francisco. Uh, I am currently an instructional technology coach for TK through 12th grade, but I spent the last 20 years in fifth grade, my favorite grade, uh, as a classroom teacher. And so right now we're on temporary assignment and kind of enjoying working with adults. So, and, for, and we all work together in the same school district as Lisa mentioned, but um, we also have all been fifth grade teachers and that's when a place that we've all spent a lot of our time in. Um, I, after being in the classroom for 15 years myself, I shifted into an induction coaching position. So the last two years I've been working in our new teacher mentor um, induction project as an instructional coach. Interesting, okay, great. And that was Kelly and then Sarah? Yeah, hi, my name is Sarah Landis. Um, I was also a fifth grade teacher um, for a long time and have been um, currently working as a literacy coach. Um, so I have an opportunity to work at all elementary schools in our district. It's been an incredible um, opportunity to work with teachers and kids. And of course we do all kinds of PD on this side. That's become our little passion. Um, we have so many opportunities. We're able to do some online um, work and we work with teachers face to face in different districts around the country, um, sometimes travel outside of the country. So all kinds of um, good things going on there. Did you all work together as fifth grade teachers at some point? <laughs> good question. <laughs> um, we all kind of found each other somehow, um, just friends along the way, but also kind of started with a passion for ELA and um, would just kind of start talking through things and realize that we love to get together professionally and talk shop and share ideas and bounce different thoughts back and forth, which is kind of how HyperDocs came to be. Um, you know, we were talking about paperless classrooms and um, just thinking about all the new shifts coming in our district with, you know, Google Apps and different devices and all kinds of goodies. So um, we just, the three of us would get together regularly and, and um, just have fun kind of talking through different things. And the next thing you know, <laughs> I yeah, I think it, it didn't even start around technology. It was really yeah. around yeah. Um, thinking strategies and uh, the workshop method of instruction. It all started around instruction. And then, of course, Google Apps came into our life and we just we kind of to... blended it in. <laughs> right, right. Okay. And so let's let's just dig right into HyperDocs. I had sort of seen something like HyperDocs before I had ever heard the term, but I feel like the term that you all have come up with has made it really, really sticky, and it's helped that idea spread way, way quicker than earlier iterations of it. So explain to us what exactly is a HyperDoc. Um, well, first of all, a hyperdoc is really more of a way of thinking. It's a digital lesson plan for teachers for using all of the Google apps, but it came out of our love of instruction. And it really, when we sat down to write the book, we wanted to share with everyone else our 
thinking of the pedagogy behind digital lesson designing with the Google Apps for Education. So that's where we came up with our um, HyperDoc lesson design template. And that even came from studying all the other um, lesson designs that we'd been using over the years as classroom teachers. So the, the HyperDoc lesson design template really came from a hybrid of all the other ones that we've been lo loving and doing in our classroom but with the 21st century learning and the four C's and the SAMR that everyone was trying to implement in their classrooms. We decided how can we help teachers understand how to do that in this new way with, with the Google Apps. So that's where the uh, formatting came from. And so it shifted from uh, well, how, what does that mean? What does that look like? And what do we call it? And that's where HyperDocs came from. But it's really, um, what it's, the offset of that has been just helping teachers to really be inspired, hopefully, to design lessons rather than just being out there and assigning what they need to do. Or in this case with uh, technology, really being thoughtful about tools that you choose and the why and creating the community around that as well. So the lesson planning has really shifted from writing down your lesson plans in your you know, lesson plan notebook to designing lessons using the Google Apps and actually handing them over to the students, packaging them um, and thinking through all the way from start to finish with the learning objective in mind and using all the tools in that way. And that's one of the things I noticed in your book, the HyperDoc Handbook, is that you definitely get into sort of how to set it up, you know, visually or whatever, but you, you sort of emphasize over and over again that this is not just about having a doc with links. It's, it's really about the thinking process and designing a good lesson or a set of lessons. It's true. And really what it comes down to is um, as classroom teachers, we're always doing this. This is what we love is to come together and talk about um, good instruction. So, for example, if you, if you have this learning objective with your students where you might want to be teaching them, um, I, I have a sample that we're going to be sharing on the, on the link to the podcast. Mm -hmm. And so, and that, the sample that's shared starts with the learning objective of teaching students about the 50 United States. But how can I think differently about that lesson now that I have access to all this technology? So, um, it's still good lesson planning where the first part of the HyperDoc begins with an engagement activity, which is a link to a video that is engaging and kind of is an overview of all the 50 United States. And you might even use that link as a um, whole group instruction for the, for the launch of your lesson. And then after watching that video together for engagement, the next part of the HyperDoc is um, a, a table on a doc with some links, which I would uh, call maybe a mini multimedia text set where now you can give the doc to the students and they can um, work in partnerships to explore all of those links and start having conversations about what they're learning. Um, and so instead of starting a lesson by standing and teaching it, they would have some exploration time. And mm -hmm. the next part of the lesson includes kind of a graphic organizer, if you will, on the doc mm -hmm. for students to start organizing their thinking on what they're going to, how they're going to show what they've learned. And the final part of the lesson has an uh, application. And so you've, you've got everything in one place where the learning, um, the brainstorming, and the applications all together for students to see from start to finish. Okay. So I'm going to, let's try to imagine that somebody listening has has literally never seen one of these before and they've heard mm -hmm. the term but they really just don't know what it is so what i'm looking at right now this this hyperdoc that you've created it it is a google doc but it contains all of the components that are necessary for learning this lesson and it's also got First of all, it's designed beautifully, so it's just really visually interesting, which is not necessarily a requirement, but it's something that makes it a more enjoyable experience. And the idea is that a teacher can use this doc as a, as a springboard for teaching. So there's like an introductory, the explore part of the lesson. That, and, and the part of it that's hyper <laughs> is, is the fact that it's got all these hyperlinks out of the doc to these other resources, right? That's right. That's kind of the gist of it. That's the bare bones of a hyperdoc. Yeah, I think it's really well planned out, Links. You know, when you look at um, a hyperdoc, 
you don't always see the lesson design behind it. Lessons can be so personal um, and you can utilize it um, in so many different ways, whether it's just give it to the students and let them work through it independently or it's blended where part mm -hmm. of it is done whole class, part of it is done guided, um, part of it is done independently. So it, it doesn't always say that because these are for the kids. They don't want to see the pedagogy necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, I think as teachers, we're um, asking um, people who see these to look beyond the pretty and the links mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. look if you were a student, could you walk through this and what would you gain from going through this lesson? Are you engaged? Are you curious? Um, does it draw you in? Do you want to par participate in this? Right. Well, and there are, you've got stuff built right into this document for, for students to participate because in this explore section, there are links to a video, links to a photo essay, links to a slideshow, but then in the right hand column, there are spaces for the students to actually jot down their own personal notes. Every student makes their own copy of this hyperdoc, correct? And then it's correct. theirs to to personalize sort of in terms of how they are experiencing these materials. Exactly. Another um, design feature I would want to point out is the mm -hmm. uh, section that says create a draft script for your video. A lot of times um, you might you might ask students to use uh, tools and they're going to be creating something. But um, before giving them the tool, it's a, a place for the students to start crafting um, quality content beforehand. And it gives the teacher time to interact with the student before they go and publish it on that tool because once it's published, it's, it's already your final product. So mm -hmm. really just thinking about um, you know, quality content with our students and how to create space for them to really show their learning in different ways and um, synthesize information in different ways, but still with with a, a level of critical thinking that we're looking for in our products from our students. Mm -hmm. And I've seen um, I've seen other hyperdocs where the teacher has actually built in a spot where they say, when you get to this point in the hyperdoc, you need to check in with me, the teacher, and have me look at, you know, or let me know that it's ready for me to look at or sort of interaction with the teacher built into the hyperdoc as well. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that we love about hyperdocs is although it seems, you know, odd that you're putting a student in front of a device, really what it's doing is it's freeing you up to move around and have increased face time with students. So it's kind of this really powerful um, concept where you're saying, okay, you're going to do this part independently, but I'm now free from, you know, teaching at the front of the room and I, I can now move around and I actually have more face time with students or I can quickly move around and check in and have good conversation. And so it's this kind of really awesome benefit that came out of um, this work. Right. Right. Well, since we're already sort of talking about one of the benefits, just it being, you know, more face time with the kids, a little bit more flexibility. Um, talk to me a little bit more about, you know, if somebody's never tried a hyperdoc. Um, I mean, one of the things I would think that someone would would be hesitant about when they first look at one of these is, boy, that looks like a lot of work ahead of time. And any teacher that's sort of gotten into the mode of planning tomorrow's lesson today um, is, you know, going to see that and think, well, that's like four or five weeks worth of work. You know, I'm not sure I have the time to do that. What are the advantages of doing something like this? What are the advantages of hyperdocs over traditional instruction? Um, so, you know, I, I can um, speak to this, actually. I think uh, when we started coaching, we really were trying to help teachers uh, in two ways, and that was to shift the way they deliver instruction, to um, have a real concrete answer to, you know, you shouldn't be lecturing so much. You know, I, I just feel so bad for teachers when they hear that because they really were like, well, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> How else? Yeah. I need to get information into their heads. And I know that feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think we bring so much with our stories that we've got. And I wanted to um, help them with a concrete example of that. And so uh, we wanted to, uh, what we, we did was we really started shifting their cycle of learning in the classroom. And you'll notice on many of our hyperdocs, we put the explore before the explain. And that's a major piece to this, um, mm -hmm. where we let kids explore a concept first. Um, and I think while it may just, um, it may not show up that um, instructional design at first, that the real um, benefit of that is that 
kids are exploring and coming up with ideas and answers about a concept on their own and it's engaging them from the beginning instead of passively listening to a teacher explain something it gives that teacher time to like sarah said um, roam around i listen to my students i'm studying them and um, hearing to what level are they understanding a concept I have the ability to pull a small group. I can work with my language learners during that time. The whole time I'm doing formative assessment in the classroom, which will then really be my basis for the next part of the lesson, which is the explain portion. When I really do need to, all right, guys, you're, you're not getting this. We're going to clear this up now. Here's mm -hmm. what the real story is. Or, wow, you guys are so far ahead. You understand this so well. I'm not going to take the class time, which is so valuable. We're going to zoom ahead or we're going to dive deep into this area that you are really able to comprehend at kind of a higher level that I haven't been able to explore with other classes. Um, that, that was a big shift for us. And, and then moving beyond just the, all right, summarize what you've learned, uh, you know, and answer these 10 questions and then take a test to us. Applying your knowledge from a lesson was so much more. Uh, we wanted to have instruction to be so much more. Um, and so there are apply piece to our um, templates. We're really, you know, now that you know this, um, so what? Um, how can you show me what you know? How can you create something um, that can not only be uh, showing me your um, comprehension level now, but you can also teach others with it. Um, the second part, though, that I think was most important, that really what I think what all three of us care about the most, we really wanted to shift um, students' learning experiences in the classroom. Um, you know, we we have children of our own in school. We watch them going through school. We watched all of our students. We want them to like it and to be curious mm -hmm. and engaged and. And we want them to feel safe and happy. You know, all those like big wish list items. And everyone's like, yeah, right. You can't do all that. <laughs> we're like, yes, you can do all that. You know, <laughs> we're going to make it happen. And so we thought, let's build these kinds of lessons that kids can't stay away from. And yeah, we can build community in that as well. You know, and through collaboration, we can make them, uh, you know, experience learning together and get to know each other and have to work together and, you know, make it authentic. And really it came down to, we, um, at the heart of teaching, what I really loved when I first started teaching was creating experiences for kids that they love so much that they come in the next day and go, what are we doing today? You know, yeah. like yeah. I'm a typical <laughs> elementary teacher. I know the high school teachers are listening going, that's not happening for me. <laughs> um, but you know, we wanted to make these lessons that even the high school students would come in and be like, yeah, I'll take a look. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and so um, we wanted to make it something that um, kind of really shifts their attitude towards learning, building that student agency, building that ownership of, of learning. Um, and I, I'd love to be the creator of these experiences and, and nudge and fix my old hyperdocs. Um, if it didn't work and they weren't engaged so that the next time I, I'm going to get them, they're going to love mm -hmm. this because mm -hmm. I've been studying them in class going, okay, that didn't work. I'm going to mm -hmm. keep shifting this until I do get the right lesson, the right mixture. When I say lessons are personal, that's what I mean. It's personal to me as an, a teacher and my style. It's personal to the, mostly to the people in my classroom, you know, and where they're at academically and, and um, emotionally. So a lot of the a lot of what you're saying right now sounds like it it depends a whole lot on what a teacher decides to put in a hyperdoc that that the format of hyperdoc itself does not necessarily guarantee any of that stuff any of the I mean I could see it it would guarantee the ownership piece where the students are not depending on the teacher to guide them through the learning experience but I would think that there are definitely sort of good and not so good ways of creating hyperdocs to where you're going to actually get that authentic learning. So I want to actually break this down into two parts. So there's the <laughs> there's the the practical because I know that when I when I was reading your book, you mentioned a lot of things that make hyperdocs um, sort of give you a better teaching experience beyond things like the curiosity and the authenticity, you were talking about things like, um, you know, the ability to differentiate or the ability to like have, you know, English language learners get different things that they might need versus, you know, other students. 
and that those were all advantages that, that you could get from a hyperdoc. Does that, does that sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think once we started um, creating hyperdocs, we started to find that those advantages um, were there. I mean, one of my favorite little stories is just that those kids that finish fast, you know, the ones yes. that are like, I'm done, now what? Um, right. You know, you're able to link extension ideas and activities for them to d have them have additional um, opportunities to do more critical thinking. And there's always something for them to work towards. And they know that they have something to do as soon as they quote unquote finish. Um, you know, it's like those little benefits that you find or you have your students that need to go back and, and rewatch a video mm -hmm. or reread something or check out that mentor text linked up, you know, earlier. Um, and so you're able to create a lesson plan that meets both of those students needs, right? right? Like I need to right. go back or I need to know where I'm going with this and I'm done and now what? So, um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the benefits, there's so many. <laughs> and the students there's are, so and the, I mean, the nice thing is that the students are not waiting for you. I can remember when I was in the classroom, I felt like I had a gaggle of baby birds that were just all <laughs> waiting for mama to feed them. And it was like, I can't get to you all at the same time. Imagining having everything in a hyperdoc, they're no longer waiting for you. Yeah. To do these things it's amazing and think about those subtle differentiation um things that you're doing where you know before we were able to do this you might know which group you were in every time you the teacher's trying to get around to every yeah. group in the classroom yeah. and it's really subtle with a hyper doc they don't know that maybe their text that is on the doc for them is at a different reading level or um, they're able to add on to use read write for google uh, and just put headphones in and that's just a little agreement between you and that student um, or yeah. the EL learner can use those closed captionings on the YouTube video. And how many times did you show a video and inspire your class? And then they might go home at night and talk about what you do at school today. Oh, we saw this really cool video, but it's in my te my teacher has it, right? So why does the right. teacher need it? They can go home and show their parents. So it's just yeah. like really a neat way of, of learning, you know? It's you know what else I'd like to chime in there too? Cause you guys are so good. You're covering it so much, but I really think about um, the different um, kinds of kids in the room, like the quiet kids. And, and I also think about the time wasters, you know, like the typical raise your hand for an answer and only the same four hands go up. Mm. And when, when we build collaboration into a doc, especially if we have um, kids who are really introverted or not wanting to share out, it gives an opportunity for everyone to answer at one time. It really compacts the learning in your classroom so that you have more time to get to what you need to get. I think um, I've watched my um, language learners look at people's posted answers and be able to read them to able to formulate and start writing their own kind of posted answers. Mm. Um, it's super subtle, like Kelly said, you know, those kinds of yeah. Tips. But they have that time, that extra little bit of processing time and even seeing their peers' responses in writing instead of just hearing them in the air, that, that's a little extra scaffolding for them right. to be able right. to process that language. It's that's actually a, for everybody, you know, because they're like, oh, that's what she meant? Oh, I could do that. Right. You know? right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, well, and the fun thing, going back to the example that, that Kelly shared and, and talked about and that'll be linked up to the blog, um, you know, the multimedia tech set is pretty incredible because there's so many different types of media that we can access, you know, these days. So there's a photo essay, you know, there's slideshows, there's games, there might be one really powerful image we want them to study, an infographic. I think, you know, living in this digital age, we're able to expose kids to different types of media that um, allows each child to access the learning or the content or the information in a way that's visually or, you know, auditorily appealing to them. So mm -hmm. I think it's so neat because I might be visual and I might, you know, first study an image, then watch a video, and then I'm finally ready to tackle that article my teacher really wants me to read. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so um, when you mention the word scaffolding, it just it just reminds me of um, the power of kind of embedding really diverse media um, right. types into our hyperdocs as well. And, you know, for all the work that it takes to put something like this together, you know, if you're teaching the same group the next year, you've got it done. And then all you're doing is refining it the next year and just replacing exactly. out that one video that didn't quite nail it for anybody and right. uh, just making it better and better, really. Well, yeah, well, and, and basing it off of student yeah. feedback, right? Right. 
if you're looking for it, if you're asking for it, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's well, let's that's let's get into the into the best best practices, some do's and don'ts. That if somebody's gonna give this a try, what are some things they should should do and not do? Well, that is perfect. That um, because one of our favorite do's is we always um, encourage teachers to definitely start with a template. Um, we have multiple templates that we've created, um, and shared on our website, but Mm -hmm. a great place to get started because the lesson flow is already built in for you. Um, or we encourage teachers to start with a pre-made hyperdoc that they have found and just file, make a copy of that hyperdoc and then just remix it, make little tweaks, little changes that fit more for, um, your class, your students, your needs. Mm -hmm. So, Those are our two kind of favorite ways to get started. Of course, teachers can always start from scratch if they have some vision for their lesson. Um, You know, start with a new doc, start with a new slide. But Mm -hmm. um, really, really valuable way just to jump right in is to start with one of our templates or start with one that you've already seen and you think, oh, that might work in my class. Um, You know, the benefits of Google Apps is just that good old file, make a copy, Um, It's like when I think about as a teacher, you know, I'd be so nervous to put my work out there. But when I think for one second that I create something that could potentially reach more students and my classroom is no longer the 30 plus kids I have in my class, Mm -hmm. but now I'm reaching students around the country. um, I think it's really empowering for teachers as well. Um, So that's something we always encourage um, Mm -hmm. teachers to do is just get started with someone else's and don't be afraid to put your work out there. Um, Definitely helpful to consider your workflow and your packaging needs. Um, You know, kind of ask yourself a set of questions as you're working through creating your HyperDoc. Is your HyperDoc going to be used for assessment? Is it used just to get kids curious or exploring a brand new topic as you launch a unit? Um, Is your HyperDoc going to be Um, you know, a one 45 minute sit down, you know, kind of a thing, or is it going to be added on to throughout a unit? Um, Will you be collecting work from students? Um, Do you plan to package your your HyperDoc on um, docs, slides, maps, sites? So just kind of thinking through some of those workflow and packaging things um, is kind of helpful as Mm -hmm. you get started in creating a HyperDoc. Um, And then we always just tell people, does definitely plan to design with your students in mind? Um, You know, if you're doing a third grade, you know, water unit and you're, you know, having them dig into the ocean, maybe you're going to use blues and green colors and you're going to use cheesy language like dive right in kids and, you know, (laughs) just kind of really like create a learning experience on your, on your lesson, on your hyperdoc that is appropriate for the age and content that you're teaching. Um, If you're high school, you know, I, I always say, put your humor, talk to your kids the way you would in class, be yourself, put jokes, use funny memes, you know, definitely design with your kids in mind and be yourself. Um, I always really encourage that. Um, Girls, did you want to add any of the do's? Am I forgetting anything major? I think, um, you know, Jennifer, you kind of mentioned, um, you know, it's kind of can feel overwhelming to think about designing a hyperdoc for every lesson. And so one of our big, big don'ts is please don't feel like you have to have a hyperdoc for every lesson. Um, That's not something that any teacher should, you know, really feel pressured to do. And it's not really realistic. I mean, at the end of the day, you want to come in and have an organic experience. And so um, we don't want teachers doing any one thing all the time because then it becomes, you know, redundant for our kids. (laughs) So I think just relieving that pressure, like, you know what, I'm going to try one hyperdoc um, a week and, or I'm going to try it just in the computer lab, or I'm going to try it, you know, just for science because I'm going to work with the science teacher and we're going to build one together or, you know, so just start small and, and then sit back and watch your students and, um, you know, just, just relieve yourself of any of that pressure. I think it's not necessary. Just have fun with it. Um, and then, you know, we always say, don't be afraid to reach out. We have, um, some incredible, Um, you know, social media resources out there that teachers and educators and administrators are using. Um, My goodness, we've been so impressed with the crowdsourcing that's happening. And, you know, teachers that are really modeling 21st century learning by putting their work out there and um, encouraging others to use it and share it. And so, you know, we always say just please don't be afraid to reach out. Yeah, I think, Sarah, I'm going to jump on that too. Um, When 
uh, when we first created this, we were thinking, oh my gosh, we have to make all these lessons for everybody? And then we thought, wait a second. (laughs) No. Um, You know, so often as teachers, we feel like we're on an island in our classroom. We might not have a team that is like-minded like us. And so we started Teachers Give Teachers on Twitter was our first um, jump into uh, finding a community of like-minded digital lesson planners who wanted to join us. And now we have like over 8,000 teachers, just word of mouth spreading, um, uh, connecting. It's, you know, where we started on Twitter and just putting links to their lessons and saying, what do you think of this? And people answering them back or, or saying, I, I'm looking for a Charlotte's Web lesson. Does anyone have one? And, or saying, hey, let's make one together. And we've yeah. had teachers from across the country start building lessons together. It's really, I think that's um, something that we, we didn't expect this piece to it. And it's one of our favorite outcomes of this is kind of the joy and the excitement in lesson planning um, and that excitement of um, creating uh, as a teacher, being creative ourselves um, is kind of bringing new life to a lot of people in their classroom, I think. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's make really clear to listeners exactly what you have available. So this is you first of all you have this book the hyperdoc handbook where you really sort of outline i mean it seems like you spend more time than anything really explaining your particular kind of template that you have um with all of those different uh, pieces the explore pieces and, and and all of that but then online you've got you've got teachers give teachers which was a twitter page but is now a section of your website hyperdocs.co correct Yes, because um, it became too much to search on Twitter. So now if you load up your lessons, you can tag them. And so then you can also search for any, you know, subject matter or grade level or even creator. If you know the name of a teacher that has been Mm -hmm. creating a lot, you can see all of their hyperdocs that way. And so people can just go on and I I went through the process myself. So I'm registered. You go in, you register, and then you can search for all of the hyperdocs that people have basically sort of registered onto your site. And then yes. if you find one you like, you just make a copy for your own Google Drive and then you just do yeah. what you want to do with exactly. it. You can use it as That's is yours. or modify it or, yeah. and, and, and you all encourage people to contribute their own as well. And, and you've got give one and take one, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we also we, encourage people to um, give each other credit on it. Yes. So if you create a hyperdoc, right. We want people to, in the header or footer, you know, say created by and maybe link to your Twitter handle or your email because for yourself. And then if you make a copy of someone's, we encourage you to, um, you know, give that person credit by saying inspired by or remixed uh, HyperDoc mm-hmm. cre- originally created by. I mean, just because um, in, we want an inclusive, like, appreciative sharing community uh, mm-hmm. where we're not out there looking. Uh, sometimes people will say, what do you think? Does this, is this a hyperdoc, you know? And it's like, I don't know because it's your classroom, you know? <laughs> it, it's really about the teaching that are going on. And so yeah. um, so when, when you create one, just honoring the other people as well that have led along the way. Mm-hmm sort of like a creative commons sort of ethos mm-hmm. where it's just we just if you're going to remix somebody else's work just tell everybody where you got it and mm-hmm. and yeah and so that that would be a really good thing if somebody's wanting to get started to just to just go and start exploring all of the stuff that has already been created to see because there really are a lot of different styles out there Yes, for sure. Yes. And it depends on what people have packaged on. Like we have some people who love to package their HyperDocs on slides yeah. um, and go through phases. I think I'm in a gray phase. All my HyperDocs are, have a gray background still. I can't get out of that. <laughs> oh, so, are you the charcoal gray? Uh, I don't know. Sarah started it. Well, <laughs> we've I all like bled into one gray. person. <laughs> I think kind of, um, you'll know ours because they're like dark gray, but um, we can't get, let go of it. Uh, but some people are really into packaging. Um, you know, some are doing them on Google Sites or forms, or um, mm-hmm. it's really neat. I am so inspired. I get so many ideas from looking at other people's work and yeah. how they've added in. You know, when a new web tool comes along, you're all excited. Like everyone's excited right now about Flipgrid and whatnot. Yeah. But then I want to ask them, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to build the pedagogy around that um, right. that 
cool tool. And where in the lesson flow would it fit in your HyperDoc? So it's really saying, I love flashy new tools. Now let's think about how you can effectively use them in the classroom and then link it into your HyperDoc that way. So absolutely. And I don't think it's got to be an either or. I mean, I hear so often when I go to like tech conferences, people say, oh, it's not about the tools. And sometimes I kind of want it to be about the tools because they're really great. <laughs> but you have to do something really worthwhile with it. You can't it can't just yes. be neato. Yeah. Yeah. They can just <laughs> type the URL to the Flipgrid on the board. You know, let's let's extend. There's so much you could do with that learning opportunity. And so you can extend it with a little instruction or, um, you know, um, a continuation from that experience. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And there well, are I... certainly patterns and trends in ed, you know, in ed tech tools. And, um, you know, Flipgrid is a perfect example of one that's being used right now. And we laugh because there's even patterns and trends in how we develop our hyperdocs. And we've been actually saying we need like a, a spring collection. What's our font and color scheme? <laughs> <laughs> spring collection. Yeah. So, I mean, it's you true. can oh, it. it, but at the end of the day, we are creating experiences that we want to stick with students. We want yeah. them to remember our yeah. teaching and learning. I think there so. is so much importance, and I think design is hugely important. Yes. Really, yes. I'm gonna, yes. I don't know if you're familiar with Presentation Zen. If that rings uh -huh. a bell for any, yes. I mean, just uh -huh. I just want that message to go everywhere because I just I don't know why not. Like, why not make? I mean, the we're in the marketing memorable. business, right? We are. We're in the marketing business. We want our kids to remember us and what we're teaching them and, and, and the content. And we're always looking for transfer and independence. I think those are two things that are kind of at the heart of lesson design. You know, how, yeah. how can I get this information and this content and this experience and this feeling that they have to transfer and for them to be independent? Right. Um, you know, so that stuff going to help. <laughs> it's so true, though. The little trends of design. You can, if we can look at some of our hyperdocs from a couple of years ago, and open them up and go, "Oh gosh, it's like, why, why was I wearing that? Why did I design it that way? I want to, I want to redo that now." Yeah. Um, and, and that is fun. And then, like Lisa was saying, all the people on Twitter sharing. Uh, I mean, they've taken the concept and gone a totally new direction. So it's just yes. the power of collaboration. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. It's totally pushed our thinking as well. Yeah, I feel like it's just at the very, very, you know, infant stages right now of where these things are going to end up going. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. That's what okay. we hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, because mm -hmm. I, I just made my own for the first time for oh, this, this online great. course. So we discussed this separately. I was I'm teaching a course and I wanted to have something in there about HyperDocs. And so, man, I worked on that sucker forever and ever and ever. And it just kept getting better and better. I was like, oh, oh I could do this and I could do this. And awesome. all of a sudden I was like, I realized there was one section where I thought, you know what? The kids are just not that active here. They're just receiving. What can I build in there so that they get a little bit more, more active? And then when I did that, I got more excited about it. It was just like, yeah, yes. you know, it really energizes so, you. It's yes. Yeah. You bring up a really good point too, is that yeah. when you, when you read about it, you hear about it, it's different than when you actually do it. Yeah, and then yeah. I'll just put it one step further. It's actually different when you watch students doing your hyperdoc and yes. it's just, how much we concentrate and study about our own lesson design and our um, in creating these learning experiences, that is such an, an exciting shift in instruction. That's what I think is great about mm -hmm. HyperDocs is makes you yeah. think about instruction yeah. in a fun way. Yeah, exactly. And it brings the joy back to lesson planning. I think for so long it's been, I just was filling out a box in my lesson plan book, you know, it's just keeping me on track and, yeah. you know, it feels really good. But all of a sudden when you're designing a HyperDoc, there's like a, a, an energy that kind of comes and we laugh when we see teachers create because they get so excited. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> and a it's living like that document. energy is this. Uh -huh. Yeah. And that's the same feeling we want our kids to have on the receiving end. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's cool. Cool. Okay, so we've we've talked we've talked about your site, and I'm going to be linking to all of your stuff in this blog post. We're going to link to hyperdocs.co, teachers give teachers. We're going to link to your uh, your Twitter profiles and everything. You also have. Let's talk a little bit about the PD that you've got: online boot camp and a master class. Oh my gosh, our uh, PD is so fun. We we designed this online boot camp that we started last summer. And I think, are we about to start our seventh cohort, mm -hmm. girls? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, this process, it, it's so fun. Again, this is why you need to find your other friends, like we, we <laughs> the three of us together, just creating together, because that's our, um, 
our little baby of designing an online class where we're using all the Google apps for education and it coincides with our book. So it's a four week class and the book has four chapters and it's mm -hmm. a book study. And every week we come together and we do a Google Live Hangout. And one of us will be leading the Hangout discussion like a webinar. And the other two will be on the chat interacting and talking to people. And we take all of our participants and put them into smaller groups. And each of us will lead a group uh, oh, so wow. that during the week we can like give feedback and talk to them and really help them design their own um, hyperdocs that work for them. And the best part is on the fourth week of our course, because there's the first three weeks, each of us will take a lead, but the fourth week, we invite participants to be on the Google Hangout with us. So we've had people from all over the United States and beyond and other continents connect and uh, they are live on the Hangout and they share what they've created with the with the bigger group there mm. and hearing their stories and transformation is really inspiring mm. um it's great so the online awesome. course just want to give a plug out for that because i think for the three of us that's probably one of our favorite things to do around all of this it brings us together and, and every week we're reflecting on what's working and and how to make it better Okay. I think it's been great, too. We um, have connected teachers to be lesson planners together, which is nice. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Bringing them together. And that, yeah. Yeah. How can people and find out about that? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, we have a link to our boot camp course. And we'll, we put, we'll give that to you as well. Okay. Okay. We're about to launch another one in June. So um, June and July. And then um, beyond that, we'll have to... Uh, be determined, but in June and July, we are for sure doing two more cohorts this summer. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, this, this episode is going to go out fairly soon, so that, that may get some people into those groups. Nice. So we're also doing master class, right? Um, our master class tour, we're trying to change what PD looks like. So when we come and uh, we do a workshop or you go to a um, conference, typically it's a one and done. You go one day and then you leave. Um, this model, we're, we're going to uh, multiple cities, including uh, Sydney, Australia. I know if anyone's listening from Sydney, you should join us um, mm -hmm. over the, um, July 4th, 5th uh, at the summit there and then July 6th. But um, we're um, doing two sessions before we, we even see you face to face. So two online sessions to build that background knowledge and that mm -hmm. understanding so that when we are live working um, with people uh, in the city uh, that they signed up for, then that is a day of just creating where it's really valuable FaceTime with one of us. And then we follow up with uh, reflections online afterward. And then even into the school year, how's it going now that you've learned this? So it's- Oh my gosh. Um, a whole yeah, different way of looking at PD. Do you want to meet us? That, <laughs> I just love that whole idea. First of all, I would love to meet you in person, but I love this idea. <laughs> I love this idea of doing the pre-work and like yes. I'm thinking now about presentations that I have coming up and I'm like, ooh, why don't I yes. do like a little video at least ahead of time? Uh -huh. or, yeah, mm -hmm. and then some follow-up work. Yeah, so oh. you don't have to take that kind of time. We always say what's stealing your FaceTime, you know, yeah. with your students. And so we want to get right into work when we're together and start making, because that's when everyone has the questions, like, you know, exactly. the technical questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. yeah so we'll be in New York and uh, Chicago and Portland. Um, and our we have a link to our masterclass uh, schedule okay. there. All right. So. Well, I will put links to all of that stuff in the blog post. And... Um, People should look on, they should look on Twitter with the hashtag Hyperdocs if they want inspiration, right? And yeah. super fun. I just searched it right now and I found somebody posted that they had their kids create yes. Hyperdocs for the incoming fourth and fifth graders. Oh they created goodness. some math Hyperdocs for oh, the next class to use. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> There's some good stuff on that hashtag today where kids are at the end of the year, teachers who've been using this format all year, really having their students design. And there's somebody else who did some math ones today, and the students were interviewed about how they created their hyperdoc to, to teach the math concept to other students. Oh, that's fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, anybody listening to this, we will, we're going to give them, because I can see a whole bunch of links going into the doc that we all are working on together. So I'll make sure that's <laughs> all in there. And if anybody's just listening, wants to go straight to you guys, they should just go to hyperdocs.co, and that would be a yes. good right, base of all yes. this other information okay for sure 
Thank you so much. This has been really fun. Yeah, it's been great chatting with you. Thank you. For links to all the resources mentioned in this episode, visit cultofpedagogy.com slash pod and click on episode 70. To get weekly updates on all my newest blog posts, podcast episodes, and products, sign up for my mailing list at cultofpedagogy.com slash subscribe. Thanks so much for listening and have a great day. This podcast is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. To learn more, visit edupodcastnetwork.com.